As someone once said, one of the most amazing things about human beings is that they know they're going to die, and yet they live as if they don't know. They try to push that awareness out of their minds, because for most people it's just a very depressing thought. They don't know how to handle it, and so they push it away. And one of the marks of wisdom is that you don't push it away and you try to figure out how to live in the presence of the possibility of death. The canon has two very striking images. One is the image that came to the Buddha when he was still a young prince, wasn't yet the Buddha actually, that probably inspired him to go off and get into the wilderness. He saw life as a dwindling pond, water's running out, and the fish are just flopping around, struggling with one another, pushing one another out of the way to get to that last little bit of water. And of course they're all going to die. The water's going to run out. It's like seeing salmon at the that little stream up in British Columbia a couple years ago. The water was only a couple inches deep, and the salmon were struggling up, 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 fighting one another for the water, trying to get past some seagulls at the beach who were trying, waiting to poke their eyes out. And they get there, and they have to flip themselves over dead salmon to get to that last little bit of water to spawn. In the meantime, they're bears, just waiting to scoop them up. It's not a very inspiring sight. In fact, it was this, that was the image that gave the Buddha a sense of terror, the Sangwega, which can be translated as terror, dismay, wanting to see a way out. That's one image. The other image is the one that comes in the story with King Basanity. King Basanity comes to see the Buddha in the middle of the day, and the Buddha asks him, where are you coming from in the middle of the day? And the king, in a remarkable display of frankness, says, "Oh." And with my ministers engaging in the sort of things that people who are obsessed with power, drunk with their power, are doing from day to day. And the Buddha asked him, suppose someone were to come to you, someone reliable, were to come from the east and say there's this enormous mountain moving in from the east, crushing all living beings in its path. Another reliable person comes from the south, and it turns out there's a mountain moving in from the south. Another person comes to the west, there's a mountain moving in from the west, crushing all living beings. Another mountain coming from the north, altogether four mountains moving in. And as he said, considering that human life is so precious, what would you do? The king says, what else could I do but practice the Dharma? Calm my mind and practice the Dharma. And then the boy says, okay, I announce to you that aging, illness, death, and separation are moving in. What are you going to do? And the king says, what else? Calm my mind and practice the Dharma. The image in the second one is much more honorable. I mean, the fact of death is still there either way. But in the first one, it's everybody struggling for that last little bit. That's not going to do them any good. And in the second one, people are doing good things that they can take with them after they die. Qualities of mind, you behave honorably in the face of death. That's what we want to do as we practice. There's a lot of talk nowadays. You look in the newspapers, it seems like everything in the world is falling apart. And it is. So what there's to accomplish? We train our minds and we're good to one another. Because that goodness doesn't go away with death. As the Buddha said, the beginning of wisdom is when you find someone who's knowledgeable and ask that person, what, when I do it, will lead to my long-term welfare and happiness? That's the question. That question is, as the Buddha said, is a form of attention. He has an interesting analysis of attention. He doesn't talk about bare attention, just sitting there and watching things arise and pass away, as if you're in a drug state. To pay attention to life means to ask questions. And appropriate attention is when you start asking the right questions, and this is a good one to begin with. What, when I do it, will lead to my long-term welfare and happiness? Long-term here is important. 
That's part of the wisdom. The other part of the wisdom is that it depends on your actions. You want long-term rather than short-term happiness, and you know it's going to depend on what you do, what you say, what you think. From that principle you can derive a lot of the Buddhist teachings. When he talks about three perceptions, or what are often called the three characteristics, those are tests to decide if something you're focusing on is really worth taking as a goal or not. The first one is it constant. Well, if it's not constant, it's not going to be trustworthy. It's not going to be long-term. Is it stressful? If it's stressful, it's not going to be happiness. And if it's stressful and not happiness, why would you want to claim it as mine? That's the anatta, not self. But you can also derive from this question other parts of the teaching, the teachings on the Four Noble Truths. If st stress and suffering are the problem, how are you going to figure, a way, figure out a way around it? Well, you try to look for the cause. And there's a cause to be found. The suffering that's weighing your mind down is coming from within. That's a really important part. We tend to blame people outside or situations outside for our suffering, and they provide material with which we can make ourselves suffer. But the actual putting together the suffering and causing it, that comes from something that's inside the mind itself. Got to see that and to comprehend that suffering and to abandon the, the cause, you've got to develop strength. This is why we're meditating. The strength of the mind that comes from mindfulness and concentration and discernment. These are the things that give you the strength to deal with these problems. And as long as the mindfulness and concentration are not yet strong, you need other forms of strength, like conviction and persistence, that you're convinced this has got to be the way out and this has got to be the way to behave. And this is the noble way to look for happiness. Because you have to ask yourself, are you going to be like the king or are you going to be like the fish? If you look inside, you're not fighting with others over the water. You're looking inside for the the cause of the problem, and you find that you've got the means for the solution inside as well. So you don't have to keep on coming back again and again and again to worlds where the water is running out and mountains are moving in. This does offer a way out. And in the meantime, you're not harming anybody, and you're providing yourself with definite wealth, definite strength, definite treasures. As they often say in Thailand, that lasts beyond death. In other words, you treat the world around you in full knowledge that it's going to die, but you treat the quality of your mind as to something that doesn't die. And that's what gives honor to what we're doing. It's what makes us a noble path. So pay attention. Ask the right questions of yourself. Where is the cause of the suffering here? And look for it inside. And it's not meant to it's not meant to blame you for the suffering. I mean everybody's doing it. And it's not to say that there are other people out there who are not misbehaving. They really are. But the question is, do you have to make yourself suffer over that? Look for the cause inside. The develop the strengths inside. The potential is there within all of us. We can develop these strengths. When the Buddha talked about the qualities that led to his awakening, there was a resolution. He made up his mind this is something he really wanted to do. There was ardency. There was heedfulness. He didn't have a monopoly on those qualities. And when he started out, he was pretty much like us. He took human qualities, though, and he strengthened them. He found strength by being with good people, getting good advice, but then realizing that he had to do the work himself. This is true for all of us. We want to be able to depend on the people around us, and we find that we can only depend on them up to some extent. 
Beyond that, it's our work. But it's good work to do. This is one of those paths that is not noble only in the end. It's noble all the way through. All the qualities that the Buddha has you develop are good qualities. There's nothing sneaky about the path, nothing cut-rate. It's a solid, dependable path. It's a safe path. Even though ultimate safety doesn't come until the end, still the fact that we're doing things that are not harming ourselves and not harming other people. There's a safety in that. Remember, we have the choice how we're going to face the fact of death. Are we going to go out like fish, or are we going to go out like kings, or are we going to go out like the Buddha? The Buddha shows you how to go out like a Buddha. Maybe not a full Buddha, but at least someone who has the purity of mind that the Buddha developed and the wisdom and the compassion. The choice is just laid there before us. So try to take advantage of this opportunity.